Hey, I'm Jesse. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Let's have a devotion together. Chapter, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. Because Paul was younger than some of the men that he would have to correct or encourage, he would have to do so with deference to their age. Uh, Dr. John MacArthur in his commentary shows how this actually is parallel to Old Testament principles. He cites Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32, Job 32, verse 4, and verse 6, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, 16, 31, and Proverbs 20, verse 29. This is something that happens in the Old Testament a lot, that we, to, to respect people who are older than we are. So when, when Timothy, as a pastor who's shepherding and leading the congregation at Ephesus, and there's an older man in the faith who needs to be rebuked, needs to be corrected, he's, you're to do so gently. You're to, you're to do so as he is your father. All right, when you disagree with your father on something, do you remember what this is like? Maybe you're a high schooler or you're a college kid or whatever it is and, and you, you saw something, you realize, oh man, like my dad who's been teaching me the Bible my whole life was, was wrong about this. How do I bring this up? How do I talk, how, how do I talk to him about this? Like, I gotta be respectful. I gotta make sure that I cover my base as well. That's exactly what Paul's telling Timothy to do. Oh, I gotta make sure I'm doing this uh, when I rebuke or correct this older brother in the faith in my church. I gotta make sure I do so respectfully. I gotta make sure that my, I've got my, my case well built. I got to make sure that I don't do this in a way that is overly harsh. The original Greek uh, describes this, this stinging, biting uh, connotation to the rebuke. I right, don't rebuke him harshly, the, the original Greek really conveys, but you exhort him as a father. You correct someone older than you in the faith the way that you would correct your own father. Same thing with, with, with younger men. You do so as though they're your brothers. How do you correct your brother? <laughs> like, well, just I smack him in the face. I don't think that's what Paul's telling Timothy to do. But when you do, when, when a pastor doesn't need to correct someone who is younger than him, he does do, do that the way that you would your brother. All right, my brother, Zach, was like the greatest older brother in, in history. My parents have pictures of him at my soccer games or my football games, like with his hand around my shoulder and he was coaching me and he was, he was, he was teaching me stuff all the time. He's always, he'd always give me encouraging words and tell me exactly what I needed to do to improve my game. That's how Timothy was to correct younger men, like brothers, like there is younger brothers. How do you coach your baby brother? When you do this correction, what you're doing is you're trying to make him better because you love him. You want him to win. So how do you correct your little brother? You do so by taking him under your arm, you, put, you pat him on the shoulder pad, you know, and you give him something encouraging because you want him to go out there and win. That's how Timothy was to correct the younger men in the church. Older women as mothers. How do you talk to your mom? That's how you should speak to older women in the church. The exact same way you speak to your mom. Timothy, when you need to correct or exhort an older woman in the church, pretend like you're talking to your mom. All right, how sweet is that? <laughs> what a sweet, what a sweet pastoral approach. This is phenomenal pastoral advice. And it doesn't, doesn't just apply to pastors. If we all do this, regardless of our offices in the church, it's, that's a sweet church to be at. And then the younger women as sisters with all purity. Paul told Timothy to watch himself when he was correcting, encouraging, or exhorting younger women to do so with all purity, with all purity. Sometimes it's called the Billy Graham rule, but uh, it, it evident, evidently it was, it's really the first Timothy chapter five rule. It's really, it's the Timothy rule. Because uh, as much as we, as we love Billy Graham, he was just abiding by this standard with all purity so that nobody could say anything condemning. It's all above reproach. This is what I, my wife and I have always done when it comes to ministerial practice. I've never given a ride to a student one-on-one -on -one. All right. Uh, I, if there's a young, when there's a young woman who was the last one to be picked up for a student ministry event, the two of us were sitting outside on the front steps in full public view. Okay, I'd have a woman come and join me so that nobody can make an accusation. Nobody can, nobody can even say anything. Because even sometimes accusations of impropriety are enough to damage a reputation. I saw that happen to a falsely accused pastor in, in Pensacola. Even though he was proven innocent and exonerated thereafter, just the accusation enough was, uh, was enough to, 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 to make him want to resign and move. That really stinks. So you, with all purity in our practical sense means that you do, so, you do so in a way that's totally upright with complete integrity. You know, uh, 
my my wife and I have always shared, you know, online profiles. She sees everything, all my emails and all my all my text messages and all my Facebook stuff. She has access to my phone and my laptop. Honestly, it's a matter of convenience. I, like I would never lock my wife out of my phone. She, I, I, in absolute purity, she sees all of my correspondence, and uh, she knows she knows everything about me. You know, uh, I don't. I'm never one on one uh, with a woman. Um, and, and for that reason, nobody could ever make an accusation. Uh, in fact, my wife and I got into real estate in the last year. Um, just, you know, uh, help make money in church planning. It's kind of hard, <laughs> but we're trying anyway. And my wife, Jessie, was hosting an open house. And there was a man who walked in to the open house. And it dawned on her instantly, this is the first time I've been alone with a man who's not my husband since we got married 13 years ago. <laughs> and she, she, she told me afterwards it was really weird and we're not super legalistic about it. It just becomes second nature over time. We're just never alone with anyone of, of the opposite sex so that nobody can even make an accusation. Nobody can even say anything. But real estate, which was a new thing for us, just put us in that environment. And Jesse started texting me. She's like, oh, this is weird. I haven't been alone with a man ever since we got married. And, and it was just odd. It felt uncomfortable. It was like putting your shirt on backwards. It was like, oh, this doesn't feel quite right. This is not, this is, this is odd for me. We're not super rigorous about it. It's just become second nature. You don't even think about it. You don't even have to talk about it. It's just how you function. It's just what you do. It's like brushing your teeth. Hey, of course I brush my teeth. Yeah, of course Jesse and I are always together. And of course I'm never going to meet with somebody alone without some sort of accountability. So uh, this is how Paul encouraged Timothy to work with younger women in the faith, like they're his sisters, completely asexually and with absolute purity, totally above reproach. Nobody can even make an accusation. Uh, this has served pastors really well over the years. Mike Pence came under fire because he employed this same approach, but the truth is that nobody can make an accusation against him because he's just conducted himself according to this standard, treating sisters with absolute purity. And the result has also been an incredible blessing. When I was a youth pastor, sorry to give too many stories in one devotion, when I was a youth pastor uh, in Orlando, we had this big fleet of buses to be able to haul the kids to events and stuff. And uh, usually I would end up driving the bus full of middle school boys. And it was just chaos. And it smelled horrible, like all the time. But then one time we had to switch buses around. One of our buses needed something done or something like that. And I ended up driving a bus full of young ladies in high school. And it was the most pleasant bus experience in all of my career. And I look back and I was like, you ladies, you are amazing. Like I wanna, I wanna drive this bus all the time. The bus smelled fantastic. And like nobody was doing somersaults down the aisle. Like they were singing beautiful songs in three part harmony. I was like, wow, man, girls ministry is where it's at. It was so fun. And I, I was really blessed by that. Like when you conduct yourself with absolute purity, you get to, you get to experience blessings like those and nobody can say anything about it. It's above reproach, it's absolutely pure, and God's hand is upon it. It's, it's an amazing, amazing way to do life. It's actually, it's, I actually highly recommend it. This is a standard not only for pastors, but it's good practice for everybody. May the Lord forgive us where we fall short in this regard. Uh, may the Lord also coach you and protect you so that you don't ever come under accusation. If you haven't been abiding by this kind of standard before, do so now. Uh, we've seen something happen within the Southern Baptist Convention wherein people neglected this. People weren't background checking their leaders. By the way, a background check doesn't always do it because a lot of offenders are first time offenders who would have passed a background check. So it's not enough even to do background checks. You also have to make sure that no leader is ever alone with children or students, but that everybody, every class, every group is always double staffed. Um, if you don't abide by this, you reap what you sow. And there were several churches within the Southern Baptist Convention that were found negligent in this particular regard. It is way better, it's way easier, it's way less painful, and it's way less expensive to just abide by this standard. And that includes even pastoral staff. Okay, I saw this happen at my previous church. Everybody who travels, get your own hotel room so that nobody can say a thing. All right, that was a policy at Lifeway, it's a policy at the Redemption Church, it's gonna be a policy moving forward forevermore, just with absolute purity so that nobody can even make an accusation. There's freedom in this, and there's catastrophe when you compromise on this.